Well, here he says, look, now he talks about holy days, Sabbath days. Uh, and he says, these are shadows of things to come. See, on the biblical calendar, uh, all the feast days are agricultural and you're supposed to be praising God for the bountiful harvest. And so God's daytime or God's calendar is all about him. It's not about you. And it's about what he did in blessing us, uh, you know, as you go around and you look at these things. And so I believe God's time clock is also based on his calendar. And if we want to know what time it is, we got to understand the way you know the pattern is by understanding the seasons, the times, and the years on God's calendar. And some people like to demean it, you know. So what he's saying to the Colossians, the Colossians are next door neighbors to the Galatians. So to the Galatians, he says, you goofballs, how come you've gone back to the biblical calendar? Then he says to the Colossians, don't let these stupid Galatians judge you because you are keeping the holy days and the times and the years. He's, he's, he's saying to those who are doing the holy days, don't let the Galatians or those that have gone back to a pagan calendar judge you because you are. And when it speaks of a shadow of things to come, shadows can tell you a lot. What is that a shadow of? An airplane. For heaven's sake, if you, you know, if you do away with the shadow, no one knows the reality is there. And did you know you, were, you are a shadow of God? The very word that says you're created in God's image is the same word used for shadow. You are God's shadow. And so that's why you want to be careful about uh, demeaning that. Now, so anyway, I think of it like a grandfather clock. We know if you look inside, there's all these gears that are controlling the time. Well, I really believe that God's calendar is the gears to allow us to know when things that happen in history are significant and if it's God trying to communicate to us or not. Now, how many have ever heard of this guy named Copernicus? Okay, what was amazing uh, about Copernicus was that uh, he was a Polish astronomer, but he never liked the Earth-based view of the universe. And he said, look, the Earth is not the center of the universe. The sun is, and all the planets go around that, right? Okay, but did you know that the church did not like that view back then? The church was very much against a sun-centered universe. And so uh, anyone who opposed this concept was branded as a heretic. And that would destroy your reputation. They'd put you in prison and even sentence you to death. Therefore, Copernicus did not write his book or get it published until after he died. And then after that, it was translated into uh, Latin. So no one could even read it and understand it for a while. But he didn't want to be persecuted by the church. Okay, so now with that in mind, uh, here's one thing. Uh, here, let me see what we got there. We got the sun. Uh, you know, they thought the earth was the center of the universe. But here's the thing. Much of the church today has the church as the center of the theological universe. And if you come against that, the church is very upset because they are the center of the theological universe. And then what we do, we put, you know, Catholics and everyone's puts, you know, okay. So everyone, all the denominations then put down how they related, you know, who's further away from the church, who's closer to the church. I mean, this is basically, you know, uh, our thinking. But I believe in the Copernicus revolution where we're going to realize Israel is the center of the theological universe. Okay. And so uh, we need to understand that. So with that in mind, look at the clock. Okay. Moed. I want to talk about the word Moed for a minute because it is incredibly important. In Genesis 1:14, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of uh, the heavens to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs, seasons, days, and years. Okay, now, so how do we look at this? When we read the word seasons, what do we think of? Winter, spring, summer, fall. Here, let me get, uh, there we go, almost there. Wow, I can't find my mouse. Uh, all right. 
But here's the problem. When we look at this, well, Wade, and he says it's for seasons. This is what we think of. But did you know that very same word is translated as feast in Leviticus 23? Now, when I read the word feast, what do I, what do you think of? Food. And so that very same word, moed, does it mean fall or food? I mean, think about it. Here you got a Hebrew word that the translators translate as two to completely opposite ways. Did you know they're both wrong? Both those translations are wrong. The word moed really implies a divine appointment as if God has a day timer and he says, here is when I want to meet with you. Uh, this is from Leviticus 23, 1 and 2. And it says, the feast of the Lord. But this is what's crazy. In Isaiah 46, verse 10, God said he declared the end from the beginning. From ancient times, those things that aren't done. Well, listen to Revelation. This is chapter 13, verse 8. End time theology. Okay. It says, all those dwelling on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life of the lamb who's been slain from the foundation of the world will worship him. Well, it talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Not 2,000 years ago. It's talking about 6,000 years ago. What do you mean? He wasn't slain from the foundation of the world. But this is telling us that God, he pre-planned that Messiah would die from the very beginning. Do you think all of a sudden he goes, oh, no, Uh, we need to go to plan B, Adam sinned. No. And so this is what it to me is incredibly, in one sense, emotional, you know, it is horrible that a parent should outlive a child. To have your child pass before you. I mean, I just can't think of anything worse emotionally than to have something like that happen. But here we have the father and we have the son, Yeshua, his son. And here the father from the foundation of the world had a conversation with Yeshua. Okay. And think about this. Did you know God, a thousand years before Yeshua came, had David write the funeral hymns that were going to be sung at his son's funeral? We will resume this teaching after a short message from International School of the Word. This teaching is one lesson taken from a full course on isow.org. If you are enjoying this video, we invite you to check out the full course in the links below. For the best value, try our All Access Pass. At just $99 per month, you can access thousands of hours worth of high quality, world-class teaching. To check local pricing in your country, visit isow.org. For more great teachings like this, be sure to subscribe to this channel and follow us on our social media platforms. Now, back to this teaching from International School of the Word. If you knew your son was going to die, your daughter was going to die, you want to make all the arrangements, you want to get everything pre-planned, God knew that Messiah would be slain from the foundation of the world, so he had King David write the funeral hymns a thousand years before. And so on that fateful day, all of Jerusalem is prophetically singing uh, the Hallel, And Psalms 118 is uh, the final of the Hallel, which is absolutely incredible. So let's just take a look at this for a minute. Um, Let me go here. Here it is. Nine in the morning uh, in uh, the Gospel of Mark, it says he was on to the cross the third hour of the day. That would be nine in the morning. Well, do you know when Yeshua is bound to the cross at nine in the morning on Passover, the the Jews were all singing the Hallel. They're singing Psalm 113 through Psalm 118. So at the very moment, and again, a convocation uh, in Hebrew is a mikra, and that means more than uh, just a meeting. It means a dress rehearsal. So every year for 1500 years, without even knowing it, they're rehearsing the death of Messiah. 
And then when King David comes, they begin to sing his funeral hymns every year for another thousand years. And so at the very moment, talk about a day timer, at the very moment they're binding the Passover lamb to the altar, they're binding Yeshua to the cross, and he hears several million Jews singing from Psalm 118, the Lord is God, he's given us light, Yeshua is the light of the world, bind the sacrifice with cords even to the horns of the altar. So Yeshua is hearing them sing, bind the sacrifice with cords while they're binding him and they're binding the Passover lamb. And then what do we find? At noon, this is when the lights go out. It becomes pitch black. All right. And now they're singing with a little bit more of a trembling voice. But what does Yeshua hear them singing at noon? Remember the verse that Yeshua said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw men unto me. Look at Psalm 118. He hears the right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. So at noon, here they're singing that and that's what he's hearing them sing. Then at three, we all know he died at three in the afternoon. That's the time of the evening sacrifice. So at the very moment they would slay the Passover lamb, there is Yeshua dying on the cross. And again, uh, we know his last words, but what is he hearing Two million Jews singing all around him. Let Israel now say that his loving kindness endures forever. Let the house of Aaron now say his loving kindness endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say his loving kindness endures forever. This is the heartbeat. This is what he's hearing. Now talk about timing. It's not only to the day, it's to the very hour. This is incredible. Now, how many believe God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? That's Hebrews 13, 8. Well, get a load of this. Now, this is the kicker. I mean, do you you believe that up here or down in here? In your gut. You know he's the same. Okay, now this may rock some of your theological world. You may may have a deer in the headlight look, but I want you to really get a load of this. If he's really the same yesterday, today, and forever... If he died on Passover, he was buried on unleavened bread. He rose on first fruits. All of those speak of his first coming. With Shavuot, the Pentecost, when you had 3,000 getting saved, these weren't pagans in the temple that got hit with the bolt of lightning. Okay? If they all happen to the very day, the fall feast will be fulfilled to the very day of his second coming. The Feast of Trumpets will happen on trumpets. Yom Kippur will happen on Yom Kippur and Sukkot will happen, guess what? On Sukkot. If he's really, this, and this way, if we're not on the biblical calendar, and the other thing is they have to be fulfilled in order. Pentecost couldn't happen until he rose from the dead. And guess what? He's not going to rise from the dead until he's dead. Okay. And so all of these have to happen in order. The same thing with the fall feast. Anyone hear anything about trumpets in the book of Revelation? Hello? Yom Kippur is all over the the, uh, book of Revelation as well. And so Yom Kippur is Israel's national day of atonement. So I believe some year the tribulation begins. The feast of trumpets is fulfilled literally. And then after that, Yom Kippur, Israel's day of atonement, they realize Yeshua is the Messiah. And then comes the feast of tabernacles where he tabernacles among men for the thousand year millennial reign. So, uh, but this is why if you're on God's calendar, then you're going to, uh, it really affects your theology in a lot of different ways. And you want to be at the dress rehearsal of the different events. Okay, so with that in mind, let's, again, let's look at Luke 21, 25. God says there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Now in Genesis, it says he created the sun and the moon and the stars for what? Signs was number one. We think it was for light and heat. But the number one reason he said was signs. What greater sign is there than eclipses? This is why God has Passover and Sukkot on a full moon, because you can only have a lunar eclipse on a full moon. This is why he ordained all the new moons, because you can only have a solar eclipse on a new moon. And so God wanted to, now there's been 12,000 some eclipses over the last 5,000 years or whatever, but most of them are insignificant. What matters is when they fall on the biblical calendar, then you connect the dots and say, okay, what is God trying to say to us? Thank you so much for supporting our ministry. 
If this has blessed you, please say a prayer for us. And if you would like to give, we have three ways that you can do that. You can give online at iso.org forward slash donate or text the word give and the amount to 423-225-9022. That's 423-225-9022. You can also give through the mail at ISOW. 340 Paul Huff Parkway, Northwest, Cleveland, Tennessee, 37312. Thank you. God bless you, and may the Lord multiply your seed. Now back to this teaching from the International School of the Word. Okay, so uh, he says there will be signs in the sun, in the moon, in the stars, and as many of you know, I talked about uh, the four total lunar eclipses that happened all in a row in 2014 and 2015. Uh, now, a lot of people wrote things about uh, on that material, which I did not agree with. And then a lot of people are saying that I said things that I never said. Anyone who listens to what I said knows what I said. But I believe just like when a bridge is out, you don't put the sign the bridge is out where the bridge is out. You're supposed to let people know a mile or two ahead, especially if it's a 60 mile an hour road. Hey, the bridge is out. Slow down now. I really believe that these were signs of what was coming. I mean, it's been incredible the last four years regardless. But I believe these were mostly about 2017, 2018, where we have the anniversary of Jerusalem back in Israel's hands. You have the anniversary of 70th anniversary of Israel. And I think the most amazing things really are yet to come in the next two, this year and next year, prophetically. You're going to see some incredible things. But the last time it happened, as you know, when Israel becomes a nation, you have these four blood moons in a row. Uh, when Israel recaptures Jerusalem, you have these four blood moons in a row. Uh, many of you are familiar with the great American eclipse that happened not too long ago. Uh, that eclipse was on August 21st. And the hurricane, uh, the big one that hit was on August 25th. Now, uh, let me ask you something. Talk about odds. I don't know if any of you guys are math people, but uh, I love math. And I, you know, was wondering, okay, when was the last time we had a total solar eclipse to go across the entire United States? What are the odds of that happening? Well, it happened 100 years ago, 1918 in World War I. Well, then the next question is, what are the odds of this major hurricane hitting Texas. Well, no major hurricane had made landfall in the United States for more than nine years. Uh, September 13th, 2008 uh, was like the uh, category two hurricane that hit Galveston that made landfall. But this one was a category four. So what was the last time a category four storm hit Texas was Carl in 1961, which was 56 years ago. Okay, well, what are the odds, though, of having a Category 4 hurricane hit Texas the same week a total solar eclipse crosses the entire United States and it happening on the first of Elul, which is highly significant. It the, begins the days of repentance of Teshuvah until Yom Kippur. Now, uh, you can all see that the, the odds are going higher, but get a load of this. What are the odds that there would be a Bible verse that talks about signs in the sun, referring to the solar eclipse, with the anxiety of nations and the roaring of the seas and the waves? Here you not only have a Bible verse talking about a total solar eclipse, you also have like a hurricane being mentioned. But what are the greater odds? It happened, the solar eclipse was on the 21st and the hurricane was on the 25th. And it's Luke 21, 25. The, the odds now are truly astronomical. Now, but even, even more than that, uh, how many of you ever heard of a UN Resolution 242? You heard of that? Uh, let me see. Okay, here it is, United Nations Security Council Resolution 242. Okay, this is the resolution uh, that was ad adopted by the UN Security Council on November 22nd of 1967, and it was all about land for peace. Okay, well, 
how many of you know that the United States is part of the UN Security Council and all of that? We're going to talk more about that in the next session. But here, it's all about land for peace. Well, Washington, D.C. is our central headquarters for our government, right? Do you know that great American eclipse happened exactly at 242? In Washington, D.C., that was the maximum amount of darkness. I think that is just another one of those interesting things that happened. Okay, but many of us are also familiar with uh, this last year. It, it, this is, you can see, Washington Post 2017. This last year has been a disaster with all the calamities. Uh, 2017, another headline, a year of disasters. Okay, uh, storms, earthquakes. Here we have North Korea and now the Las Vegas massacre. Remember that? And people say they have to wonder what is next. Uh, talk about disaster. This is from uh, uh, an article I read. It says uh, concerning the calamities of this last year, the number of Americans registered for federal disaster aid jumped tenfold in 2017, costing billions of dollars the fallout will cost taxpayers tens of billions of dollars. Uh, matter of fact, the White House asked Congress for an additional $44 billion in disaster relief. Uh, as a matter of fact, it says FEMA enlisted private phone bank companies and employees from the Internal Revenue Service to pull off the Internal Revenue Service just to add 3,000 uh, staffers to add to all the disaster claims that happened. Now in uh, Luke 17, 26, it talks about as it happened in the days of Noah, even so it will be days in the son of man. Okay, days of Noah. What are the things that we remember about the days of Noah? What happened in Noah's time? Flood. Okay, look at this last year. Flooding in China like crazy. Sierra Leone, floods and landslides. This is all in August, right around that solar eclipse. Hurricane Harvey in August. India, flooding in August. Hurricane Irma, flooding. I mean, all around this total solar eclipse, God is bringing floods all over the world. Bangladesh, a monsoon. Uh, just Hurricane Maria in September, over and over. Vietnam, a typhoon in November. We're just seeing flooding going on worldwide. Okay, how about earthquakes? We had major earthquakes again uh, in Mexico. Uh, here's another one and look at the caption underneath this. It says with four big hurricanes, a powerful earthquake, wildfires in the Northwest. We had all kinds of wildfires. It seems that nature has gone nuts. Uh, this is, I mean, this is just incredible. A uh, big earthquake in Iran, uh, then the wildfires in Northern California, as well as, uh, up in the Northwest. And I know you guys have wildfires in this area as well. But I believe the number one thing concerning the days of Noah is more than flooding, because even God said it, he won't flood the whole earth again. It's going to be by fire the next time. Do you want to know what the number one reason why God destroyed the earth? Does anyone know? Sin. Let's read it. Let's see what it says. Genesis 6, 11 through 13. The earth was filled with violence. And God saw that it was corrupt for all flesh, he says, has corrupted its way in the earth. So God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me because the earth is filled with violence. And when we look, Chicago, nearing 600 homicides after a weekend of violence leaves five dead. Here's 30 alarming statistics that show the reality of sexual violence in America. Here in Pennsylvania, 45 teachers resigned because of the students' violent behavior. As a matter of fact, uh, this one article I read said the 20th century was one of the most violent periods in human history with almost 200 million people dying due to conflict. And it said that every single day there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic hotlines. Every minute, 20 people are physically abused by someone else. I mean, we are living in an age that is so like Noah's day. Uh, how could we not understand what's going on? And it says in Luke 21, 28, when these things begin to happen, where are you supposed to look? Look up. 
Okay, to look at the signs in the heavens, to look at what else God is trying to tell us because the redemption is near. Now, when you hear Matthew 24, what it comes to your mind? Matthew 24, the last days. This is all about the last days. So let's take a moment, though. But here's what we got to do. We got to pull our Greek hat off and put on our Jewish hat. Because how many of you know when you study the scripture, you have to look at it in context. So listen to Matthew 24, 6 through 8. It says, you are going to hear of wars and rumors of wars. Okay, so if you're sitting there in Yeshua's day and you're hearing him talk about wars and rumors of wars, what wars are going to come to your mind? What, what wars are they going to be thinking of? They're going to think again, they're going to see that was 70 AD was when Rome destroyed the temple. But we're talking around 30 AD here. That hadn't happened yet. What wars is in the Jewish mind when he says wars and rumors of war? Hanukkah. Okay, that is huge. That, you know, around 168 BC, the whole story of Antiochus, Epiphanes and Hanukkah. And the other one is going to be the ninth of Av, which is when the temple was destroyed. The Babylonian captivity. So they're thinking, okay. If so they thought he was going to come back in his own day. So they're thinking, wow, this temple in front of us is going to be destroyed probably on the ninth of Av, which it did happen. Uh, but also, wow, Hanukkah. People, if you want to understand Matthew 24, I can tell you right now, Matthew 24 is Hanukkah happening all over again. And if you don't know anything about Hanukkah, you're not going to see the connection. But let's take a look at this. So their frame of reference is going to be around 587 B.C. when the temple's destroyed and around 168 B.C. Uh, with the Maccabean revolt and the whole story of Hanukkah. Okay, so now let's listen to this verse. Uh, before I go there, let me say this. Okay, so now the, you know, the Jewish believers today, they're going to understand the ninth of Av. They're going to understand Hanukkah. And so what was one of the first big wars that took place in this generation was World War I. World War I, uh, we always think in the United States of 1917, because that's when we entered the war, but it actually began on August 1st of 1914. And guess what that was? The ninth of Av. So when they're thinking, now we have hindsight 2020, they're thinking the ninth of Av. And what happens? World War I starts on the ninth of Av. We're supposed to go, wow, this is connecting us to this generation, to Matthew 24. Now, did you know the United States joined the World War I on April 6th of 1917, which just so happened to be Passover that year? Okay, so there we have another connection. Well, guess what? In 1917, you know what else happened? This is when General Allenby walks into Jerusalem on Kislev 26, which is Hanukkah. And so here, when you're reading Matthew 24 with, through Jewish eyes, and you read wars and rumors of war, you're thinking of the ninth of Av and Hanukkah, and World War I has the exact tie to the ninth of Av and to Hanukkah. And then it talks about how the, uh, the end is not yet. Uh, but there's going to be uh, all uh, the nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And it mentions all these things. And it says this is the beginning of the birth pangs. But then in Matthew 24, it goes on to say, learn the parable of the fig tree. Who is the fig tree? Israel is the fig tree. And it says, when it becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, know it is near. It's at the doors. And then he says, most certainly I'm telling you, this generation will not pass away until everything is accomplished. 